Today on this episode of DC Profiles we will discuss GBG Lil Active, some of his fallen men and the arrest of him and his man for the 23 Racks hit. First we will get into Lil Act, Lil Act is a rapper from the Douglas area in Southeast also known as the Zed. I discussed this hood on my channel before in a every hoof beefing video. But today I will get more in depth and break down some paperwork about Rondon Henderson also known as Lil Act. Lil Act has been a character but he was always behind the scenes and would start catching a buzz with the name Lil Act around 2022. But before the name Lil Act he would go by Rondon and Baby Bro, Rapper Money 5 shouts him out in the song. Five Guy posted November 6, 2021 saying, Baby bro Rondon went on a mission. At the time of this line the Z and 23rd were cool with each other, and Lil Act can even be seen here with a member from the Z and Fat Hefe from 23rd. But they would put a clown over his face. Lil Act has two of his fallen men in his bio saying Long Live 5 and Long Live Glock. He also shouts them out in songs. Five is a member from the Z who is also referred to as Slime, who was killed February 2022 on 12th, and Robinson PL after ops spent. They rip. No suspects would ever be apprehended. But members from the Z and 23rd would say, Long live slime. Months would pass. And Z member Mazaglock would be killed after trying to spin Sir some quarters uptown. After he is killed 23rd rapper would diss him causing Z members to come. And spank 23 racks the same day. After he would post on his Instagram story, him on front line sitting down smoking. When we first met Taimisha Robinson a year ago, she was inconsolable. Her son, Jamarid, killed near DC's Johnson Middle School. Why you had to kill him, kill him like that? That's crazy. Jamarid created a fashion startup. He wanted to be a designer and made his clothes after virtual learning. Tamisha misses seeing his vision grow and his smile. I feel horrible. Like, it's, I'm not the same. I'm not, my, I'm not the same at all. Tonight, MPD confirms its investigation into the 15-year-old's death is still active, not a cold case. He was shot multiple times in Southeast, the crime scene here on 12th Place. I remember that day like it was yesterday. He just left out the house. He was, he wasn't even outside for, he was only outside for a good seven minutes. Part of the reason we Zoom today is because Tamisha doesn't feel safe in her own neighborhood. She's trying to find a new home with her three kids. Tell me what your family is like now. It's no, it's, I mean, family is torn apart. Like, it's, it's no family. She's pleading with anybody who knows something to call police. And as for what she would say to her 15-year-old's killer. For the person that did it, God bless them. That's all I can say. Mike Valerio, WUSA 9. A painful reality in our nation's capital. These six people were shot, one of them killed. For the fifth consecutive year, homicides in the district are now rising. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser has declared gun violence a public health crisis. I asked him one day, I was like, I'm scared of dying. I asked him, was he? He said, no, mommy. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser announced a People of Promise initiative targeting around 200 people identified as at risk of being involved with gun violence. I didn't know he was on that list. To know one bullet took my son's life. The story of Jamez shows the challenges and complexities of trying to save just one person on this list. show you him. I got a lot of pictures of this baby. Stop me this. As a kid, he was a dance machine. <laughs> That's Jamez right here. <laughs> Some of his favorites were Michael Jackson, Usher. He was really funny. He's very caring. A mama's boy, he's very protective. As he was growing up, he got bullied a lot. Jamez grew up for a large part of his childhood in Southeast DC, an area that is known to have various crews and gangs operating. And his mom says that growing up in that neighborhood changed his personality dramatically and made him feel like 
he had to be strong and tough in order to survive. I watched him transform into a, a person that I didn't know. It started with a lot of fighting. It started with him getting in trouble. It started with him not functioning properly in school. When Jamez was 16 years old, he was charged with first-degree murder. Authorities at the time said that he killed another 15-year-old and then stole the Nike Jordan shoes off of his body. His mom disputed that account from the very beginning, and it was later overturned. And she says that conviction changed Jamez's life and made him feel like he was a criminal even when he wasn't. He had more anger built up because everybody's looking at him as this. It made him have more behavior problems because he felt like he couldn't get what he needed to get. He couldn't do what he needed to do until we cleared up his name. What we know is that a small number of people are bringing gun violence to the District of Columbia. And so we developed a program called the People of Promise Program. The idea is if DC can focus on those specific people and pour resources into them, they can address some of the root causes of violent crime. Mental health services, trauma particularly, housing, job training, and job support. People who are on the ground doing frontline work in the communities trying to build trust have really struggled with the existence of this list. They say that people in the community see it as a sort of hit list and that it diminishes their credibility the second they're connected to it in any way. We've learned that the DC government has had a really hard time reaching a lot of people who they identified as needing help. It's very unclear how much of that is because of the government's own inability or inadequacy, or if it's that these people are simply extremely hard to reach, especially when they don't want to be reached. And we have over 50% of the list that we started with engaged with us in programs and talking with us on how to better their circumstance so they don't have to be involved in gun violence, I, I think is, is really good work for a, for a startup program. I was a worry person. So every time my son would be outside and then it's though in my neighborhood, I hear gunshots all the time. I was scared. So I would call him every five minutes. He was like, mom, you know I'm not outside. Like, stop calling every five minutes. And I'm like, okay, okay. So this one particular day, I said, I'm gonna give him a break. So I didn't call. I'm on my way back from the store. I just literally walked in the house, not even five minutes, I'm going up my steps. And I hear this banging at my door. And it's Jamez's friend. And he was like, your son is dead. And I was like, what did you just say to me? He was like, Jamez is dead. The district says they made as many efforts as they could have to reach him. They poured resources into him, they say, but he was often hard to find and harder to convince to take part in the programs that the city offered. His mom, in large part, disputes that and says if the city would have tried harder and done what they said that they were going to do, her son would be alive. So many people are dying in DC right now in incidents that don't get that much attention. And there is a fundamental belief among people who work in this space that each person who is killed in this way or kills someone in this way has the potential for a better life. And the question we're trying to explore here is how can we as a society, can we as a city, help those people achieve that. Fox 5, the family of a young D.C. rapper killed in Southeast D.C. last week opens up about his battle trying to keep his teenage son away from D.C. streets. 16-year-old Justin Johnson was shot and killed in Southeast D.C. last Thursday morning. Stephanie Mirrors is live outside of D.C. police headquarters with that interview. Steph? Sharetta, the number one message this family has for the community is that 16-year-old Justin Johnson had a family and he was loved. I spoke with his father today who tells me he is still in shock and that a number of people were trying to help get his son off D.C. city streets. 
I heard a rap, one of his raps for the first time the other day. Cause I didn't even want to listen to it because it didn't, I wanted him to go to school. So he said, I got one foot in and one foot out and one of those raps and I, and I'm, and I don't know what to do. Cause they were saying, Justin, come with us. His managers and them, come with us. You got to put that behind you. But he said, no, no, I'm better off right here. Michael Johnson is the father of 16-year-old Justin Johnson, a teen many knew in the neighborhood and on social media as an up-and-coming rapper named 23 Racks. The teen's manager tells Fox 5 the young rapper signed with a label named MGE in 2020. Johnson's father tells Fox 5 he didn't know that much about his son's rap career. Michael Johnson says his son grew up differently and as a child was an A student at J.O. Wilson Elementary and steward in Northeast D.C. His father says the son even received tuition offers to attend private school. However, as the older Johnson says his son got a little older, he started acting out and running away to be with friends in Southeast. In the family's battle, Michael Johnson tells Fox 5 he even asked court officials to hold his son on a previous gun arrest trying to get the 16-year-old help and sought counseling, but it took too long to get a diagnosis. These are the teen's sisters. It's hard to see on social media that you know, he's really gone. And I see a lot of comments on social media saying like, oh, well, he was in the streets at 16 and he didn't go to school and it's that he was wow. an honor roll student. <laughs> they skipped him a grade. Like he was street smart and book smart. Like he was well before his time. It take everybody to help these kids. Now we will get into the paperwork. On Thursday, May 26, 2022, at approximately 1124 hours, members of the Metropolitan Police Department's 7th District responded to the report of a shooting at 2234 Savannah Terrace, Southeast. Upon arrival, police officers located a juvenile male victim inside 2234 Savannah Terrace, Southeast. The victim was unconscious and unresponsive and suffering from apparent gunshot wounds. The victim was subsequently identified as Justin Johnson, here and after referred to as the decedent. 2. The District of Columbia Fire and Emergency Medical Services, DC FEMS, were summoned to the scene. After finding no signs consistent with life, the decedent was pronounced dead at 11.37 a.m. under the authority of DC FEMS Medical Director Dr. Robert Holman. The decedent remained on the scene until transported to the office of the chief medical examiner for an autopsy to determine the cause and manner of death. 3. The Metropolitan Police Department's homicide branch assumed investigative responsibility. Your affiant was designated as the lead detective in the case. 4. On Friday, May 27, 2022, Dr. Kristen Zagisi of the office of the chief medical examiner conducted the autopsy of the decedent. The autopsy revealed that the decedent sustained two gunshot wounds to his body. The decedent sustained one gunshot to the left side of his back, which struck both lungs, the aorta, and exited through his right chest. The decedent also sustained one gunshot wound to his right arm. 5. As a result of the autopsy, Dr. Giese determined that the cause of death was multiple gunshot wounds. Dr. Giese ruled the decedent's death a homicide. Scene and Body 6. The scene is located in the 2200 block of Savannah Terrace, SE. The block is a cul-de-sac with multiple apartment buildings. On the sidewalk in front of 2230, 2234 Savannah Terrace, SE, there was a blood trail that leads into 2230 Savannah Terrace, SE. On the first floor landing was where the decedent was observed laying on the floor. There were used medical supplies around the decedent. The stairs to the second floor had a trail of blood leading to the top. Towards the top of the stairs, on the wall, was smeared blood. On the stairs was a set of keys and a black face mask. 7. 
across the cul-de-sac from 2230, 2234. Savannah Terrace, SE, to the rear of 2225 Savannah Terrace, SE, is a grassy area where 11, 11 shell casings were located. In between these two points was a dumpster surrounded by a wooden fence. There were multiple apparent bullet holes in the fence. Apartment 14, first floor, of 2234 Savannah Terrace. SE had a bullet hole in the living room window. A bullet hole was observed in the living room closet, but the projectile was unable to be recovered. Apartment 24, second floor, of 2234. Savannah Terrace, SE, had two, two bullet holes in the living room. A fragment and a projectile were recovered in the living room. Apartment 34, third floor, of 2234 Savannah Terrace, SE, had an apparent bullet hole in the window. No additional evidence was located in the apartment. In the street in front of 2230, 2234 Savannah Terrace, SE, a single fragment was observed. 8. The decedent was observed lying supine, covered in a blue sheet, on the first floor landing of 2230 Savannah Terrace, SE. The decedent was clad in a ripped white tank top, ripped black jeans, three layers of compression shorts, white socks, and white, blue, and yellow sneakers. There were AED pads affixed to the decedent, along with an intravenous tube in the left shoulder and decompression needles inserted on the sides of each lung. 9. A firearm was removed from the decedent's waistband before detectives arrived by a police officer. In the front right pocket of the decedent's jeans was $9.55 in US currency. In the decedent's right coin pocket, a plastic bag containing blue pills was located. In the right rear pocket, a debit card with a name that did not match the decedent's was located. 10. A Nibbon lead was generated from the firearm recovered from the decedent's waistband and the following cases. 1. An armed carjacking, non-contact shooting at 6900 Walker Mill Road, Capitol Heights, MD, on April 30th, 2022. And 2. An ADW gun at 22-2T4, Savannah Terrace SE, on May 13th, 2022. The Nibbin lead was not microscopically confirmed. On-scene witness interviews 11. Witness 1 was located and interviewed on the scene. Witness 1 stated that it was in line getting food from a food truck near the location where the decedent was murdered. 12. Witness 1 reported that it heard 5 to 7 gunshots. Witness 1 said that it immediately fell down to the ground for safety. Witness. I said that it observed a brown Toyota RAV4 make a right-hand turn onto 23rd Street. SE prior to going out of view. Witness 1 could not provide a description of the license plate on the Toyota. 13. Witness 1 advised that it observed the RAV4 occupied by two individuals. The driver, a black male wearing a white hat and white shirt, and a front passenger, a black male wearing a black baseball style hat. 14. Witness 1 went back into the laundry room of a nearby building for safety. Witness 1 also reported that prior to the shooting, there were a group of black males at the circle of the 2200 block of Savannah Terrace, SE. 15. Witness 2 was also located and interviewed on the scene. Witness 2 stated that it was working at a nearby construction site when IT observed a black male subject wearing a white t-shirt and blue jeans standing in the walkway in front of one of the apartment buildings. Witness 2 stated it also observed a young girl standing in the walkway as well. 16. Witness 2 stated that it then heard numerous gunshots and dropped to the ground to avoid them. Witness 2 stated it. Then observed the same black male subject run into building 2230, and an unknown female pick the young girl up and take her into building 2334. 17. Witness 2 stated it did not observe who was shooting, nor did it know where the gunshots came from. CCTV review and investigative efforts see name. Detectives were able to review CCTV footage that was recorded at the apartment complex, Woodbury Village, in which the decedent was murdered on the date of the murder. 19. Detectives viewed a CCTV angle from a camera affixed to 3249 23rd Street, SE. This angle shows the intersection of 22nd Street, SE and Savannah Place, SE. The timestamp that is digitally inserted into the frame is incorrect. However, the CCTV system records the correct time in a system-generated timestamp. 
the system-generated timestamp reflects an accurate time, and it is this time that is referenced throughout this affidavit. 20. At 11.06, 12 a.m., three subjects are seen in the camera walking southbound in the alley that runs north and south between Alabama Avenue, S.E. and Savannah Place, S.E. These subjects then turn left and walk east on Savannah Place, S.E., towards the apartment complex where the decedent was murdered. See Figure 1, 21. At 11.07.05 a.m., these subjects stop in the intersection of 22nd Street, S.E., and Savannah Place, S.E. All of the subjects appear to be wearing all black clothing, including long-sleeved sweatshirts and long pants. Additionally, all three subjects concealed their faces with black face masks. One of the subjects appears to have a white emblem on the left chest area of the sweatshirt the subject is wearing. It should be noted that the observed temperature in Washington, D.C., via National Airport, at 10.52 a.m. on May 26, 2022, was 68 degrees Fahrenheit. See Figure 2, 22. The subjects continue to walk westbound, where they enter an LA that spares 3245 23 Street, SE and 3224 221 Street, SE. The subjects are then picked up exiting this LA and entering a courtyard in the Woodbury Village apartment complex at 11.08.40 a.m. Figure 3 shows a CCTV camera angle affixed to 323523 Street, SE, which captures this courtyard, 23. At 11.08.52 a.m., the three subjects interact with two other individuals who are walking in the opposite direction. Additionally, one of the subjects in the group appears to have red and white accents on his shoes. See Figure 4, 24. The three subjects then walk out of camera frame and are captured on a second CCTV camera angle of the same courtyard. The subjects stop after walking a few feet, then turn around and walk back through the courtyard and leave through the same alley by which they had initially entered. 25. The subjects are captured again at 11.09.54 a.m. on the camera affixed to 3249 23rd Street, S.E. Figure 5 shows the subjects after they exit the alley and continue to walk southbound on 22nd Street, S.E. 26. At 11.10.16 a.m., the subjects are seen still walking southbound on 22 Street, S.E. via a CCTV angle positioned on the same building, but displaying the opposite direction as the camera depicted in Figure 5. Figure 6 shows the subjects continuing southbound. 34. As the shooters are firing in the direction of the decedent, the decedent is seen running, tripping over what appears to be a small female child who is next to the decedent, and running into building 2230 Savannah Terrace, S.E. This is the building where the decedent is subsequently located by police officers. 35. The shooters retreat back behind 2225 Savannah Terrace, SE and are not seen again after the shooting. 36. In the area where the two shooters were standing, 11, 11. Shell casings were located by police officers and Department of Forensic Sciences, DFS, evidence technicians. All 11, 11 shell casings were 9 millimeters. 37. Your affiant and debt. Braxton canvassed the area to determine how the shooters may have accessed the rear of 2225 Savannah Terrace, SE. There is a black wrought iron fence that lines the rear of the property. See the green line in figure 8. Behind 22225 Savannah Terrace, SE is a trail, yellow rectangle in figure 8, that leads from the rear of 22225 Savannah Terrace. SE, down a small hill and into the parking lot located behind 33330 22 Emmett Street, SE. This trail is easily walkable and littered with various discarded items and trash, indicating frequent use. 38. Your affiant and debt. Braxton were provided additional CCTV footage by a citizen who wished to remain anonymous. The citizen lives in the 1800 block of Tobias Drive, SE. The citizen provided two ring video clips that were taken at approximately 11.28 a.m. on May 26, 2022, approximately 6, 6 minutes after the decedent's murder. Figure 11 shows three individuals running, 41. In addition to showing the three individuals, the ring camera recorded audio of the group passing the camera. In the audio, as the three approach the camera, a siren is heard in the background. 
the lead individual and middle individual depicted in figure 11 begin to run at the sound of the siren. The third individual is then heard saying the following, Walk, oh my god, if I get locked up because of you bruh, stop running. Fuck, you throwing me off. This why I don't do sh with you bruh. 42. In an additional video, the three are seen running between houses and into the alley that runs east and west between Stanton Terrace, S.E. and Bruce Place, S.E. The individuals are then out of camera view. Development of Derrico Johnson as a person of interest, 43. On May 28, 2022, Dedham Braxton received information from Inverin Stout that Inverin Stout had been contacted by a source of information that may have information about the decedent's homicide. 44. On May 29, 2022, Invain Stout contacted Det Braxton after speaking with the source of information. Invain Stout told Det Braxton that a non-testifying reliable source of information, who is not an eyewitness to the homicide, provided him information about the homicide. The source of information stated Derek Dimond Johnson, with an Instagram account of blackwood8, has a son with the nickname of Rico, whom the source of information stated is one of the suspects in the homicide. 45. According to the source of information, people have been approaching Derek Johnson about his son Rico shooting 23 racks. Your affiant is aware that the decedent is a well-known local rapper with the stage name 23 racks. 46. According to the source of information, Rico's father has stated he does not want to be a part of the situation. Additionally, the source of information did not know Rico's true name. 47. On June 1, 2022, Det. Spate of the Homicide Branch informed your affiant that he had been contacted by a source of information. The source of information informed Det. Spate that an individual by the name of Derrico Johnson was responsible for the murder of the decedent. 64. Johnson said that he met with his aunt, who was with another male. Johnson was shown an image from the same camera depicted in figure 4 and Johnson identified the two people he interacts with as his aunt and a male friend of the aunt, 65. Johnson said that the group then left the courtyard area after he saw his aunt. 66. Johnson was then shown a CCTV still frame of the group of subjects walking down 22 Street after leaving the courtyard. When asked, Johnson said he could not tell where he was in the image. 67. Johnson stated that the group walked down to the end of 22nd Street, SE, where there is a parking lot. This parking lot is adjacent to the yellow rectangle depicted in figure 8, that is the trail allowing access to the area where the shooter stood during the decedent's murder. 68. Johnson said that when he got to the parking lot, he got in the vehicle with the female. He described the vehicle as a white Toyota Camry. Johnson said that the two males did not get in the car with him. 69. Detectives asked Johnson if he had his cell phone with him. Johnson stated that he did. Johnson stated that he had not loaned his phone out to anyone else during that time. 70. Johnson also stated that he had heard gunshots as he was getting into the car in the parking lot. He could not recall how many shots he heard. 71. Johnson said that the female driver took him to his sister's house, which he indicated was in the area of Alabama Avenue, S.E., and Stanton Terrace, S.E., though he did not provide an exact location. Johnson said that he stayed at his sister's house for a few minutes before leaving and walking home. 72. Detectives pointed out that Johnson indicated he was walking with the two other males down 22 Street, S.E. Then, according to him, he got into a car and drove away from the area, leaving the other two males. After a few minutes of being at his sister's house, he then walks home where, at some point, he meets back up with the same two males. Johnson stated that the two males happened to be walking by when Johnson left his sister's house. 73. Detectives asked Johnson if he had a gun with him when he was in the area of the decedent's murder. Johnson first said no, then said, yeah man, I'm sorry. Johnson stated that he carried a gun to protect himself. 74. Johnson was asked what kind of gun he had. Johnson said that he forgot what kind of gun he had. Johnson said he couldn't remember the caliber of the gun, but said it was probably a 4 fifth. 56. Johnson told detectives that his father's name is Derek Johnson. This appeared to corroborate the information given to detectives by the first source of information, paragraph 42-43. 57. Initially, 
fact, Johnson denied being near the scene of the decedent's murder on May 26, 2022. Johnson stated that he had woken up, gone to a nearby convenience store, and then gone straight back home. 58. Your affiant and debt. Braxton proceeded to show Johnson CCTV still photos that were obtained during the investigation. First, Johnson was shown the still image that is depicted above in figure 13. Upon seeing the image, Johnson was asked if he recognized the person in the image. Johnson stated, that's me, I can see that, obviously, that's me. Johnson identified himself as the person. 59. Johnson proceeded to tell the detectives that he had previously lied and that he was in the vicinity of the decedent's murder. Johnson initially said he had been wearing shorts but corrected himself after seeing the CCTV images. Johnson also said that he was wearing black Nike boots when he was outside. 60. Johnson stated that he had gone around 23rd Street, SE, in order to see his aunt. He said he then walked down the hill, which he indicated as being 22. Street, SE. Johnson said when he went down the hill, he got into a car with somebody, whom he could not identify, but stated was female. 61. Initially, Johnson also said that he was alone and was not with anybody when he was in the area of the decedent's murder. Detectives first showed Johnson the image in figure 11, to which Johnson stated that he had just met up with the other two individuals while he was walking home. 62. Detectives then showed Johnson the image depicted in figure 2, pointing out the similarity in clothing, particularly the white emblem on the sweatshirt of one of the individuals. Johnson again corrected himself and said that he also saw the same individuals while standing in the intersection of Savannah PISE and 221D Street, SE. Detectives asked if Johnson could identify himself in the image used in figure two. Johnson pointed to the individual in the middle of the group, indicating that was him. 63. Johnson told detectives that he then walked into the Woodbury Apartments complex in order to go see his aunt to go get something. Detectives showed Johnson a still image from the same CCTV camera that is depicted in figures 3 and 4. Johnson again identified himself, pointing to the male that appears to be leading the group of subjects. 75. Detectives asked Johnson if he had given the gun to one of his friends, and Johnson said no. When asked where the gun was now, Johnson said that it was gone and that he had gotten rid of it. 76. At the end of the interview, Det Decker seized Johnson's cell phone in connection with a separate ongoing homicide investigation. After this, the interview concluded. 77. Detectives then drove Johnson to an address he specified and dropped him off. Follow-up CCTV obtained 78. On June 9, 2022, your affiant obtained additional CCTV footage from the Apple Tree Early Learning Public Charter School. Douglas Knoll location, with an address of 2017 Savannah Terrace, SE. 79. Figure 14 below shows the overhead map of the area, with this location marked. Now we will get into the paperwork of the GBG Lil active arrest. The family member informed your affiant that IT had received the information from the streets and was not from an individual with a first-hand account of the decedent's murder. Using these photos, your affiant created a Be On The Lookout Bolo flyer, seeking the identities of these subjects, which was disseminated to members of the Metropolitan Police Department on July 21, 2022. Arrests of Ronald D. Sanderson and Individual 1 on July 21, 2022. On July 21, 2022, your affiant was contacted by a Metropolitan Police Department officer who informed your affiant that the officer had located the subjects depicted in the boy O that your affiant had disseminated earlier that day and that the subjects were both being placed under arrest. Both subjects were positively identified as Individual 1, whose identity is known to law enforcement, and Ronald E. Anderson. Individual I was charged with camming a pistol without a license, and Henderson was charged with possession with intent to distribute marijuana. Both Individual 1 and I Anderson were transported to the Alamoside branch. The handgun that Individual I was in possession of was a 40 caliber Glock. The shell casings on the scene of the decedent's murder were 9 mm. At the homicide branch, your affion attempted to interview both Individual 1 and Henderson. 
Locke's subject invoked his Miranda rights, and so neither was interviewed. The police booking photo of I. Anderson is depicted below in figure 19. 100. Your affiant noted that in MPD's record management system, RMS, Ronald Henderson is listed as having the nickname Day Day. 101. Your affiant noted that it appeared that the family member of the decedent had misidentified the individuals when supplying the original information as arrived in paragraphs 92, 93 to your affiant. It appears as the individual that the family member identified as Bobby Brew is, in actuality, Ronald Henderson. C. Figer 20, 102. On Julie 10, 2022, members of the Metropolitan Police, Department 6th District were conducting patrol operations when they observed suspected narcotics in plain view inside a vehicle. Upon searching the vehicle, the off-dicers recovered narcotics as well as a firearm. We still got a lot more papers to go over, but I will get into that in episode 2, part 2 video. Like, comment, subscribe. Get this to 300 likes for part 2 of DC Profiles GBG Lil Active. Follow Stroffing DMV on Instagram for all channel updates too.